From Wondery, I'm Nikki Boyer, and this is Call Me Curious, where every week I'll get to the bottom of those funny, strange, puzzling, or just gotta know questions you have. And we'll tell you the best we can what the answer is. Cause I've got 21 questions, I've been 21 guessing, you could teach me a lesson. Call me curious, call me curious. Hi there, and welcome to Call Me Curious. I just want to say thank you for listening. Actually, you should be thanking me because we have a really great show today. We're going to talk about witches. Now, if you're like me, your ideas about witchcraft were mostly formed by reruns of the classic sitcom Bewitched. And if you're not familiar, that's okay. It's about a 400-year-old witch turned suburban housewife played by the beautiful Elizabeth Montgomery. Her nerdy husband thinks that if anyone knew he was married to a witch, it would destroy his career. So he tells her, no more magic. So Samantha pretends to swear off her powers, but being a badass boss witch, she still casts spells on the sly. One twitch of her nose and the carpet vacuums itself. I need a Samantha in my life. (laughs) Nowadays, Samantha would not have to hide a thing because witchcraft has gone mainstream. The hashtag witch talk is one of the hottest things on TikTok right now. Spell casting supplies and other pagan accessories are a multi-billion dollar business. And it's likely that someone in your cul-de-sac has joined a coven. So how did witchcraft come out of the broom closet to become so trendy? What exactly do modern witches do? And the question that we're going to answer today, could your neighbor be a witch? We're going to find out on Call Me Curious. (laughs) But first, please welcome my familiar, Mr. Malone. Hi, Malone. Hi, Nikki. You know what? What? I am bewitched, bothered, and bewildered. (laughs) Isn't that your natural state? (laughs) You know it is. And I am fascinated by witches. Who isn't? Right. And I love that there's this witchcraft interest now and Wicca. I'm fascinated by it. I know a little bit about it, but... I'm 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 ready to learn more about it. Oh my gosh, I can't this is gonna be perfect for us then today because we are gonna dig in. You know, it's funny because when I uh when I think of witches, I think of Halloween type stuff, right? Like the pointy hats and the bubbly <laughs> yeah. cauldrons and flying on brooms. And it actually got me wondering. This is what I do on my time off. <laughs> I wonder <laughs> where did all of that come from? So I did oh. a little bit of research. On Wikipedia. <laughs> I, I, huh. knew, I knew that would land on you. Okay. Um, so pay attention because this gets a little NSFW, which is not safe for work, which I had to ask my producer what that stood for. <laughs> NSFW. I don't, I don't know what that means. First of all, I work in a closet by myself, so everything's safe for my work. <laughs> so there is no clear consensus on how the pointy hat thing came to be, right? There's a few theories, but none of them are very satisfying. But... Malone, everyone is in 100% complete agreement on how the flying broom thing happened. And it's probably (laughs) not what you'd guess. (laughs) Hmm. How did the flying broom (laughs) begin? Okay, so way back in the Middle Ages, people accused of witchcraft were often found using a green ointment or a potion made up of poisonous plants. It was a really powerful hallucinogen that would, like, trip you the F out and make you think that you were flying. Got it? The trouble was, it was also a very poisonous concoction. Like, if you ate it, you'd get sick or die. Uh. So, in order to get this hallucinogen working, you had to apply it to the skin, Hmm. right? Instead of ingesting it. And to do this, they would dip the handle of the broom into the magic flying potion. And they would use that to get to the parts of the skin that could absorb it the best. One of them being the armpit. The other crevice was not the armpit. Was it the butthole? (laughs) Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. What was it? (laughs) Let me read you a, a couple combined quotes from ancient texts, okay? The witches confessed that on certain nights they would grease the staff with ointment, then amble and gallop and ride upon it to anoint themselves under the arms and other hairy places. Oh, Nikki, 
right? So if you think about it, when you're riding a broomstick, you are riding a broomstick. Oh my God. That is this true? <laughs> this is the one thing that I found that was true. And that's where the idea of riding on a broomstick came from. <laughs> Wait, Nikki. Yeah. So you're saying that a witch's broom is like a psychedelic dildo? Oh my gosh. So, okay, Malone, I think what we should do is find out what the people think. So let's see what our very own Dax Jordan could conjure up with the people on the street. Hi, Nikki. I'm in the park to find out what's cooking in the coven with witchcraft. Do you believe in witchcraft? No, I've never believed in it, but I know people who do. Oh, do you know actual witches? Um, yeah, so if they, you know, they're Wicca, I assume they call themselves witches. So yeah, I do, a few of them. Mm-hmm. Why do you think witchcraft is becoming so popular now? Ooh, I don't know. I guess maybe just as a, an antithesis to the modern, like, oh, religious establishment, which is great. I love that. I love taking that down. You love the modern religious establishment? Right, no, yeah, not the opposite, exactly. Do <laughs> uh, you know what sound a witch's car makes? No. Broom, broom. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> they told me to say that. If they made a spell and they forced you to do it, you, that was against your will? Yeah, I tried not to do it. God, what a weak spell, but it was a great joke. <laughs> I see you're uh, partaking in some uh, herbal remedies yourself. Do you believe in witchcraft? I do. You do? Have you ever had any experience with witchcraft? Well, I, a lot of my family, they're very indigenous. Uh, they come from Mexico, so it's very, like, a thing. It doesn't have to be, like pointy hat or anything like that you know it's all about herbs and like any remedies if you think you could fix something with herbs or like with energies then that's witchcraft that is witchcraft it's just knowledge of natural kind of remedies why do you think witchcraft has become so popular i blame stevie nicks <laughs> stevie nicks is the witchiest woman out there of all the celebrities right oh definitely uh do you believe in witchcraft uh, not necessarily, no. I mean, I have friends that, that practice it, but I myself, I guess, am a little bit more of a skeptic myself. <laughs> but do you believe that intentions can uh, create a reality? Possibly, yeah. I think so. <laughs> All right, so you believe in spells and witchcraft? <laughs> sure, I guess so. <laughs> Are there any Hollywood celebrities that you suspect might secretly be into witchcraft? Um... Gwyneth Paltrow, maybe, because she's just bizarre. <laughs> you know what? You're the second person in the last 10 minutes who says Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, do you believe in witchcraft? I don't. For, I mean, no, I don't. I mean, I believe in, like, ghosts and stuff, but, like, witchcraft, like, people putting spells on people, no. Do you believe in witchcraft? I believe that people believe in witchcraft. I can't say that I, per se, believe it or practice it, but... Yeah. yeah, you believe that people believe it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's a real thing, yeah. Um, so you've never cast a spell personally. I wouldn't really say I've cast spells, but writing and speaking, those definitely manifest things. So, so, so you believe in the power of uh, you believe in the power of setting intentions, or more creating the world around us through our speech and through the words that we write. So, like a spell. So like a spell, yeah. So I guess I do cast spells. Thanks. Total witchcraft. To to totally. I'm practicing witchcraft and I don't even know it. And that's all I've got today on Cauldron Curious. Interesting stuff, Malone. Huh. You know, I'm always kind of surprised by our friends on the street. <laughs> always. Always. I love the honesty of the people on the street. So I think it's time to dive in. We have two really great guests today who can give us some details on the rise of Wicca. So in just a moment, we'll be speaking with Brie Luna, a.k.a. the Hood Witch, to learn more about what it means to be a sorceress in the modern world. But first, I know, right? I heard you go, like, Yeah, because yes. I love that name, the Hood Witch. I know. That is so good. Yeah. Like, there needs to be a song written about with that, you know, like, the Hood Witch. Yeah. But our first guest has been called the leading authority on modern paganism. She's a professor of sociology at Brandeis University and the author of books like Solitary Pagans, Contemporary Witches, Wiccans, and Others Who Practice Alone, and Teenage Witches, Magical Youth, and the Search for Self. So please welcome Dr. Helen Berger. Hi. Hi. Hello. We are so happy to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so, I, I mean, let's just start at the beginning, Dr. Berger. What is Wicca? Like, generally speaking, what do Wiccans believe? Okay, so, first of all, Wicca is a religion, and most scholars believe that it began in England 
in the 1940s. Oh. And what they believe is less important than what they do and what they experience. Okay, what do you mean? So I always like to start by talking about what composes religions. And there's a lot of things, and we don't have a whole semester. (laughs) So I'll only pick three of them. Okay. Three things are beliefs. Okay. Rituals or actions and experiences, spiritual experiences. Okay. So in Christianity, the emphasis is on belief. And so people are always asking, what do witches believe or what do Wiccans believe? And there are some things they believe in, but that's far less important than in the actual experiencing of the divine. Okay. So when I began my research in 1986, a long time ago, I um, met a man who was a witch, um, and men as well as women can be witches, although there are more. Don't they call them warlocks? No, they do not. (laughs) Thank you for the correction. They do (laughs) not. Um, And he said, I don't believe in the goddess. I've experienced her. Oh. Hmm. And I spent a long time trying to get my mind around what he was telling me. Because he said, well, scientifically, there is no proof for another world, for God, goddess, another Mm -hmm. world. He said, so I don't believe that. He said, but I've had experiences in which he put himself into a meditative state, and he has had direct experiences with what he calls the goddess. Okay. Other people would call the spirit world or the other world. And it's those experiences that are so important to him, much more important than any belief. I think it's interesting that he went straight to the fact that she's a goddess, by the way. I think it's fascinating, right? I love it. Me too. So I want to get this right, wrap my brain around it. So most religions have believers, but Wicca has practitioners? Yes, they call themselves practitioners. And because it's the rituals that are the most important, but the rituals put you in an altered state to come in contact with the other world, whether it's the goddess, the god, the spirit world. All right. So does Wicca have like a a Bible or a set of rules, so to speak? No. No. It has, nope. it claims it has one rule, do as thou will, as long as thou harm none. It's the Wiccan read. Oh. Wow. This is, okay, this is interesting because I think a lot of people assume that witchcraft and spells have more mischievous origins, but do as you will, but harm none is sort of their motto. Right. That is their motto. But what does that mean? That. And there is this notion, there have been... Literally, people have written dissertations on what does it mean to harm none. And it's a, that and many of them say, well, that's almost impossible, although some of them include this in. So I am in the Boston area, and we have a terrible parking problem. Okay. And so one of the spells that people regularly do here, and in New York where I come from, is parking spells to get yourself a parking spot. <laughs> this is great. Right? Because it's something that you truly, believe me, need. If you don't want to spend a few, either pay a fortune at a parking garage or spend a good part of the rest of your life circling around <laughs> until somebody comes out. Got it. Okay. Right. So there, there's rituals to get a parking spot. One of the things that some people add when they're doing the spell is basically find me a spot as long as it doesn't harm anybody. But I always think that if I get a spot, somebody else doesn't. There's a finite number of them on the street. (laughs) True. And to some, (laughs) and and they're (laughs) in high demand. And so can you do that with really harming none? You know, you don't want to take a spot away from somebody who's disabled or... Right. This is about intention, I think. Like setting out a good intention not to have anybody get hurt or harmed, but opening up and do what you will, right? Do as you will. Yeah. But give me a parking spot because I need one. Give it to me. 
I like it. Okay. So let's talk about spells, right? And um, I, I'm interested because Wicca and witchcraft are often interchangeably used. Is there a difference? Like, or is one part of the other? There's a difference. All Wiccans call themselves witches. Okay. Male witches, female female Wiccans, male Wiccans, they use the term witch. And they'll say, just as you did, Nikki, they'll say that they are either in the broom closet or they're out of the broom closet. That's a very <laughs> standard expression. That's one closet I haven't been in. <laughs> no one really enjoys being in closets. and But I remember... No, they don't. <laughs> Should be a spell for that. Get me out of the closet. Mm. In 1986, when I began this research, a lot of people were in the broom closet. And for good reason. Mm. I had testified in and provide legal counsel legal informa- information to the lawyers, I should say, for a number of people in uh, divorce cases in which their being a Wiccan or a witch was being used against them. Oh, wow. And some people were afraid that it would harm them at work if people knew. Hmm, okay. So... I, I'm, what I'm interested in is, like, when did it start not becoming that? When did it start becoming more mainstream? Okay, so several things happened that made it more mainstream. So when I began, 1986, very few people were out of the closet. And even those who were out of the broom closet were cautious to whom they shared that information. Mm-hmm. I used only pseudonyms. I never gave too many details about what people did or didn't do. Okay. I I was very careful because ethically I did not want to ruin anybody's life. Okay. And um, then people started coming out voluntarily. They started being interviewed in newspapers. And it was much like people coming out who were gay. All of a sudden, people realize, oh, that's my neighbor. He or she is not some horrible, weird person. They're the people next door who, Mm -hmm. you know, the last time I got sick, kindly picked up some milk and bread for me because I couldn't go out. Or who, um, you know, when I had a problem offered to keep my dog for three days so that I could go because somebody in my family died. I know them. There's nothing peculiar about them. And that's how people started to accept people who were gay. Because I remember when people were in the closet being gay because they were afraid of the very same things that the witches were afraid of. So what time are we talking here when you felt like they started to kind of come out of the broom closet a little bit? Oh, this was the 1990s. They were coming out of the broom. Some people sooner. Mm. Some people were braver. Some people uh, were earning their living within the metaphysical world. It made it easier. Okay. What factors have led to the surge in the popularity of witchcraft and pagan faiths? Like, why am I seeing this so much more now than ever before? Okay. America helped change the religion. Why? Because there are so many of us here. And so that we were buying the books, we being Americans. And, of course, me as a researcher, I was buying all of them, too. <laughs> but um, people bought the books. And when the Internet became more widespread, people were on the Internet. Okay. And, first of all, it was women who were feminists. Because of the goddess. They were looking for Mm -hmm. a female face of the divine. This provided it. Secondly, it was people who were concerned about the environment. Because this is an earth-based spirituality. Mm. That's interesting. Thirdly, it was all those hippies who wanted to question authority and wanted to do their own thing. Right. Because there is no central bureaucracy, there is a good deal of individual innovation. And so the religion grew, and as it grew, it started to be better known, and more people started to know somebody who was a witch or at least a pagan, because there are other okay. forms. And then there were all of those TV shows. Right. Uh, 
be- not so much Bewitched, which was earlier, but right, but the other ones the, like uh, what was it? Buffy Charmed, the Vampire, Buffy, Charmed, yeah, right, yeah, and they became very popular, and now we have an upsurge of teen witches again. As you mentioned at the beginning, TikTok witches. So we have another growth. Right. I think I'm starting to understand this a little bit more, um, Dr. Berger, and I'm so grateful for you kind of peeling back this witch onion for me. (laughs) So I think this is actually the perfect time to bring in our next guest. But Dr. Berger, please stick around because we want you to be a part of this. I need to know that it's real, know that it's real. So tell the truth. Our next guest is one of the Internet's most popular and celebrated witches. According to her website, thehoodwitch.com, she combines astrological real talk, eclectic rituals, meditations, and tarot spreads, juxtaposed with old Hollywood glamour and devilish humor. We are thrilled to welcome the Hood Witch herself. Brie Luna. Hi, Brie. Hi, Brie. Hi, how are you? We are so good. Good. It's so nice to meet you. I am so excited to be on the show. Did you get anything from what Dr. Helen Berger was sharing, like the history and all that, and like good stuff? Did you get anything out of that? Well, you know, it's interesting for me um, as a woman of color, as a black and Mexican witch. I, I've always had such a love for information when it comes to the occult and esoteric wisdom. Um, especially surrounding witches and witchcraft. Um, You know, so that's something that's, like, really exciting. And hearing from Dr. Berger, you know, there's a lot of information I already knew. Yeah, But it's fun to hear um, just from a different perspective. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. So I understand um, that one of your missions as a public figure is to raise awareness about sort of non-European witchcraft traditions. Tell us a little bit more about your background. So, okay. Um, For me— All of my love of, again, like the occult and esoteric art and magic and books, a lot of it came from my own um, just inner, I guess, my own inner witch, uh, my own baby bruja uh, growing (laughs) up for me. I knew, you know, I was always just very different, very eccentric. I knew I tapped into um, energy outside of what was seen as the norm. And so I always grew up believing that witches, you know, were white women, like these very ethereal, you know, when you watch like Lord of the Rings or The Craft, there wasn't a lot of women of color in media, especially when it comes to magical themes or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's true. That were seen as women of color. So I always just envisioned and just saw witches as being either like really scary, you know, the hag or this very right. beautiful, you know, it, it's always just been Green. presented as exactly like ward on the nose. Yeah. But then tapping into my own family and my own culture. So both of my grandmothers are what you would consider witches. They would not call themselves witches Mm -hmm, (laughs) Um, mm -hmm. because, again, as Dr. Berger was saying, a lot of older people were in the broom closet, but I wouldn't even say so much as the broom closet. There's just more um, of a connotation, you know what I'm saying, that comes with that title of being a witch or being um, a bruja. Like, in Spanish, it's, like, still a witch. So I think that it's... It's just something that was always kept very hush-hush and very secretive because you didn't really know how you were going to be perceived. And that is something that I think a lot of black uh, and brown people, you know, in this modern age, I see it being more embraced where we can come out and be like, okay— This is, we're now tapping back to our ancestral magic. We're now reclaiming our practices that have been appropriated. When, you know, this new age movement in the 80s came out, you hear like shamans and everyone, you know what I mean? Everyone's like into crystal healing and drumming. So it's like we are now reclaiming parts of ourselves that were stolen from us and taken away from us and now being able to, especially for me, I'm able to present that in a manner that's digestible. It's fun. It's informative. It's colorful. It's freaky. You know, it's exciting. And I'm very grateful to be in a space and a position to do that. I love this because there has been a shift of Wicca. Like, Wicca got a bad rap, right? And now it's becoming more of a spiritual practice. I can see that, you know? Yeah, and I think that 
you know, initially in the 90s, you know, you had this big popular culture with Wicca and, you know, it was very white. It was very Mm -hmm. European based. But then you have people like me where we're like, okay, I don't see any representation. I don't see Mm -hmm. anyone who looks like me. I'm not from Europe, you know, and, and I have just such a love. And I think there's so many other women of color and especially, like I said, black women and Latinas, like, very intrigued in wanting to connect to our spiritual practices. So that was a huge mm-hmm. factor for me in, in even starting The Hood Witch. That's great. Can I ask, how old were you when you first discovered witchcraft? So I would say, and you guys are going to laugh at this, when I was probably about, I was in sixth grade or fifth mm-hmm. grade. No, it was sixth grade. I remember mm-hmm. watching The Craft at a slumber party with my girlfriends. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time seeing Rachel True as a black teenage witch. Yep. And I was just like, oh my God. And so one bone I have to pick with this movie is that she was villainized. She got in trouble for using her magic against racism. Mm. And if you guys remember in that film, she was being harassed and bullied by a white student. And so she used her magical power to get revenge and made the girl go bald. And... <laughs> I wow. never understood how this Wiccan, like, law of three, like, do no harm and don't hurt anyone. I'm like, okay, so what are you telling the black girl right. witches? Like, if we use our magic to protect ourselves, that we're going to be punished for it? Wow. Right. But it but it opened you up. It opened you up to all of this. It did. And so years later, you know, I mean, I guess I, let's take it back. So when I was 12 years old, I remember watching in popular culture— That was the influence. However, my grandmothers, I come from two very magical, very beautiful, culturally rich backgrounds. So my dad's mother is from Texas and Louisiana. So our family has very deep Southern roots. And also my mom's mother, she's Mexican, American, you know, so she's Mexican. And having two of those like really powerful, very rich, very beautiful. You know, I, I, we, I didn't grow up with Wicca. So we have like Huru, we have Santaria, we have such a colorful and very different, you know, mixture of spirituality and religion that I grew up with. But to me, I didn't see them as being witches because again, on pop TV, I was only seeing European, Harry Potter, you know, like this, yeah, these type yeah. of... Right, right. These type of, So there's no representation. And I think that oftentimes African traditional religions um, are, are demonized in popular culture. So then right. we're now, you know, and you have like the voodoo zombie or like, you know what I'm saying? Like everything's yeah. always very yeah, dark, see, even in negative. America. It's all dark. A lot of people think that about Wicca, witches, and, but it's not really about that. It is and it isn't because it, it is to a certain degree of, like, what is dark. Do you know what I mean? Like, in in one person's culture, sacrificing a goat is not dark. But in other religions, I'd be like, oh, you're harming an animal. Do you know what I mean? So it's like you have to put into perspective, and this is where I think this reclaiming in traditional spiritual practices for Black people, for you know, Latino people, it's like having these um, very, like these, these are important differences. Right. I yeah. absolutely agree. That's right. Can we go back to when you were a kid? Because I'm like picturing you as a cute little witch kid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, so what kind of ca- so, what kind of spells were you casting yeah. back in the day? <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you guys one of my first spells, and this is hilarious. So when I was about 12 years old, I had my own coven, which I put together with three of my girlfriends who I am still friends with today. Oh, I love that. Still best (laughs) friends with now. Um, And so we had this book and it was called How to Turn Your Ex-Boyfriend into a Toad and Other Spells. (laughs) And I thought it was, it was like, that was like our Bible. We were just like, oh, this is the book. So I had a crush on this boy. Of course, of course, my first spell was a love spell. Right. And and I remember this boy, he was in high school. So I was, I think it was probably, yeah, like seventh grade. And he was in high school and he was so cool. He was like this punk rock boy and he had like a green mohawk and the spell required that you had a snippet of their hair so I went up to him 
No. And I actually asked him, can I cut a piece of your hair off? And he was <laughs> and he was just like, what? And I'm like, I, I just need it. And I can I have a piece of your hair? So he's like, well, at least you asked him and didn't just like yeah. cut it off his head. <laughs> like oh, I would have done. So, <laughs> so I cut his mohawk. I cut off oh. a piece of his mohawk and I did the spell. And of course it didn't work, but... You know, it, it was it was it was, it was it didn't worth, work after all that. It didn't work. It didn't work, but you know, fast forward to being an adult now, um, probably about five years ago, uh, he found me on Facebook no. and tried to meet up with me for drinks. So maybe the spell maybe did it work. Did yeah. work at the time. It only, took, yeah. <laughs> it only took five years. I mean, it took like how many years later, you know, to like work. That's so funny. Yeah, but it's kind of it's kind of good not to put a time limit on maybe spells or uh, intention. Like, put something out there, but don't expect a, a time frame. You never know. I That's think it could, I think the spell did work. I agree with you, um, especially when it comes to like spell working. There's so many people who like they want a quick, fast, That's right. easy, quick fix. But one of the things I like to tell, you know, a lot of our readers and some of my clients is just like, when you do the spell, you do it and just leave it alone. Interesting. You know, like don't focus too much on the outcome. You have to know that when you're doing the magic, when you're doing the spell, you've set that intention. But I find that when people... Uh, hyper fixate too much on the the spell itself. It's like you're not allowing. Well, you're blocking it, right? It's like you're you're not you're putting too much expectation. Right. Just leave it alone. This but that's so true for life. You know, Absolutely, you, right? Yeah, we get in our our own way. You know, like uh, people always ask me, like, how do I? I'm looking for a sign. I'm all, I'm looking for a sign, and I'm always say, well, stop looking. You know, <laughs> right. just accept that it's coming, and and then you'll you know you recognize it when it's here. I agree. Okay, so Bree, now that you're older and you're wiser and have been practicing Wicca for some time, I'm curious to know, like, what are your practices now? Are they still all love spells? (laughs) Some of them are. (laughs) (laughs) Some are love, you know, but I I think that truly, like, the, and I know this is going to sound cliche and just kind of corny, but maybe not. Um, I think that some of the biggest love spells and the best love spells really starts with yourself. Mm, no, I love that. And having that love of self and do the spell on you. You know, like there's people who want to manipulate and, oh, I want this person to fall in love with me and only me. But I'm like, you don't want to bind like abusers or, you know, So I, I think right. that. As I've gotten older and my practice has really deepened, I've learned so much from my elders, from other witches, you know, that I've traveled and met and, and have connected with over the years in my in my life and in my own spiritual journey and my understanding of what my practice is in, you know what I mean, and, and what it isn't. And I think a huge part of my magic and a lot of what my spell work surrounds around, it's like it's very much trial and error. It's very much what feels right to me. Does this feel good? Does this, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and, and a lot of it is very intuitive. So yeah. um, you you find what works for you. And I, and I firmly believe that the real is what works. So I, I'm so on board with this, but to me, it doesn't sound, being a witch doesn't sound any different than being an intuitive, meditative, intentional soul in the world that's just very open and free thinking and puts out intentions. How is your practice of magic any different than that? I think that you just nailed it. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I think. I think that that's the beauty of the archetype of the witch. Like the witch can do whatever she or he wants. The power of being the witch is fully and unapologetically embracing who you are. That's why witches have always been demonize yeah. if you're an ugly old hag or if you're a sexy seductress. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like no matter what, people are going to find some reason to hate you and hate what they don't understand. So there's no one size fits all of what and who the witch is. I need to know that it's real. Know that it's real. So t- so what type of magic do you practice? Like, is it is it like other world magic or is it more about energy? So for me, it's always about energy. I think that all uh, magic originates. So I generally tend to work with hoodoo. I work with candle magic. I 
implement color and planetary aspects. Um, so I am a solitary practitioner right now. Um, I have worked with a coven. I do have a, a coven of women that I enjoy practicing with mm -hmm. when I'm in New York. Um, but just in general, I tend to tap into folk, I guess what people would call like a folk magic. You know, it, it comes from my own family. It comes from my own intuition. It comes from people who are very dear to me. So, you know, it, it's always just like verbal, like very word of mouth, handed down. You know what I mean? Like that type of information. So. So, Brie, this has been so fascinating talking with you. Thank you so, so much. But I'd actually love to bring Dr. Berger back into the mix and find out her thoughts on everything that we've been discussing. So, Dr. Berger? First of all, when you said how to turn your boyfriend into a frog, I almost leaped out of my chair. One of the first teenage witches I interviewed mentioned the same book. Oh, that's so and, funny. And also, I have to say that absolutely you're correct that when I started doing the research, it was almost completely white, but not anymore. Right? So now I have to ask you a question, though. You're in a coven. Do you celebrate the Sabbaths? Do you celebrate the cycle of the year or the moon cycle? I do. With um, I found a very diverse and wonderful group of women that I practice with. Well, women and like non-binary people. So it's very exciting. But yes, we do celebrate all of the Sabbaths and phases of the moon. I write about the moon phases a lot um, on my site and also utilizing internet platforms. Okay, so wait, Dr. Berger, hold on. Can you explain what the cycles are that you mentioned? So there's a yearly cycle, the beginning and height of each season. So we just had Beltane, which was May 1st. Surprise, surprise, it celebrates fertility, right? Spring, we have bunny rabbits, we have flowers coming out, fertility. We then go on to the beginning of summer and then the height of summer. And we go into the fall, which are harvest seasons. Then at the height of fall, we start talking about and thinking about things dying, like leaves falling off the trees. And in the fall, Samhain celebrates death. And if you right. think about the fall, there's a lot of death. And it is a celebration of death because death is seen as a natural part of the life cycle. And interestingly enough too, Dr. Berger, I love that you were bringing up about Samhain because, you know, throughout South America and Central America, we have Dia de los Muertos, and then you go into Haiti, where, you know, in, in voodoo, you have Fet Gede, which are all celebrating and honoring death and the spirits of death. And I think that's really beautiful how so many different cultures around the same time, like how this is a huge theme for everyone. Absolutely. It's all it's all very real. That's what's happening in nature, mm -hmm. right? It's the cycles of nature. Mm -hmm. And then there's another cycle, which is the moon cycle. New moon, quarter moon, full moon. And that's another cycle that's every 28 oh, days. I didn't know that. And that particularly for women that becomes mm -hmm. very significant. The moon is seen as a feminine aspect and 28 days is a typical menstrual cycle. Is that why they have witches always in moons? Yeah, right? <laughs> you know, they're always <laughs> flying so funny, in front Malone, of the full I never moon. Thought of that. <laughs> they're always in front of the <laughs> Well, it's true, you know, when you have like the goddess Celine and you know, yeah. there's just, there's so many like uh, symbolic references to That's women right. and the moon. And then, you know, at the full moon, many women draw down the moon, they lift up their arms and they draw down the goddess into Well, I them. need to do that. Isn't that wonderful? They yeah. draw down that power. They should call it the woman See, exactly. in the moon, not the man in the moon. <laughs> I agree. But, you know, I have my own full moon cycles. It doesn't necessarily coincide with Wicca, but I have my own my own little things I like to do. I love that. Ooh. <laughs> I love that hood witch. <laughs> what do you like to do? Can you share that? I like getting naked under the full moon and going out into Ooh, nature. So it's not very wonderful. different, but... <laughs> <laughs> I want to run naked in a full moon. You need to do that next time. It's fun. Go howl at it. Nikki, let's do it. I'm so down, and I'm very sensitive to the moon. Sometimes I'm like, what is going on with me? And my husband will be like, uh, I think it's a full moon. Okay, so all this stuff that we're talking about is 
is it part of Wicca? I mean, I think it's all witchcraft, right? It, all of this is part of Wicca, but it's also part of other traditions. It kind of just all, you know, that's what I was like saying. I love so much how there's so much connected, you know, cross-culturally, even if you're not celebrating yeah. Wicca, it's still a prevalent energy that recognizes the cycles of nature and life and death mm-hmm. and rebirth. And um, I also think the freedom that having this um, arise or this renaissance, this modern witch renaissance happening right now, I think so much of it is having autonomy over mm, your own body yeah, and having this inclusiveness and, and being able yeah. to say, okay, it doesn't matter if you're gay, if you're straight, if you're non-binary, if you're black or, you know, it's, that's the beauty of where we are right now. So I think there's almost like, when I started doing Hoodwitch, I feel like there was a love-hate relationship from, like, the older people from all practices that were like, you youngsters are giving up too much of our information and you're not doing it the old school way. But now you have them just kind of like, oh, okay, well, this is good for me because now I get to be an elder and give real information and start utilizing these platforms. And and now it's like, wow, I get to, like, embrace my power, my sexuality, my culture, my nature. I get to do all of these things and it's beautiful. And I think the more reliable and information sources that we have, the better. I love that. So Brie, in 2022, do you think your neighbor could be a witch? I am your witch neighbor, but (laughs) (laughs) absolutely. I think uh, your neighbor absolutely can be a witch. I think your doctor (laughs) is probably a witch too. I mean, and, and think about it historically, Doctors were seen as being like, you know, witches uh, to a certain capacity. And my tax man is a practicing witch. So this, <laughs> so I mean, we're living in times where, of course, you don't know who's the witch and who isn't. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Berger, I have to know what you think. You've seen a rise in Wicca. Um, could your neighbor be a witch? You know, there are, I would estimate, over a million witches in America, and they look like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Brie looks like a pretty normal, (laughs) attractive young woman, I should say. She looks like she could indeed be your neighbor. There there are people who are lawyers. There are people who are doctors. There are people who are engineers, as well as people working, you know, there are, of course, nurses and people working in metaphysical bookstores. So it's very hard to determine who is and who is not a witch. Oh, this has been so much fun. I love this. Thank you both so much for helping us understand Wicca. Bree, Miss Hood Witch, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. And Dr. Helen Berger, thanks for shining the light on all this good stuff about Wicca and witches. Thank you. It's been a pleasure meeting you, Bree. I hope I get to speak to you again. I will come and visit you in, are you in Boston? I I like going to Salem. I will meet you in Salem and take you to all the historic spots. (laughs) Nikki, wait, come. (laughs) What about Nikki and I? We want to be part of the coven. Wait, Nikki, you guys can come too. We'll meet in Salem and we'll get naked under the full moon. (laughs) I love this. Perfect. Oh my my goodness. Wow, Malone, that was a lot of fun. So much fun. I think it's so interesting that what we think in our minds as witches, like the pointy hats, the cauldron, the evil yeah. laughter, like it's, it ain't like that. It's like- It ain't like that, no. Nikki. They're but the, it is fun. I mean, like they're the PTA members. They're the amazing yeah. neighbors that are growing delicious things in their yard. They're the lead singer of the band that you love. Like you never know who could be practicing Wicca That's or who right. could be a witch. Yeah. <gasps> you never know. Oh, Malone, thank you so much for being on today's show. I love it. I love when you're here. Oh, Nikki, thank you. I love being here. <laughs> Mwah. I'm kissing Mwah. you. Bye. Bye. So what's the bottom line? Is your neighbor a witch? Well, as we've learned today, humans crave spirituality. And with the growing isolation that has been brought on by technology and the pandemic, we as a human race are not just finding it in traditional churches like we used to. Witchcraft, with an emphasis on individuality, inclusiveness, and respect for the natural world, meshes perfectly with so many of today's big social movements, and that's why it's exploding in popularity. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yes, there is a very good chance that one of your neighbors is, in fact, a witch, especially if she lives in a house made of candy. Okay, that's our show for today. Hey, tell us what questions are on your mind. 
send us a voice memo or you can email us at callmecurious at wondery.com. Or you can even hit me up on Instagram at Nikki Boyer. I would love to hear from you and get to the bottom of all your questions because I don't know stuff too. From Wondery, I'm your host, Nikki Boyer. Our theme song is Tell the Truth by Yana. Thank you to Mr. Malone for joining me on today's show. And thank you to our guests, Dr. Helen Berger and Brie Luna. New episodes drop every single Thursday. Rich Goodman is our senior producer. Polly Stryker and Gary Lucy, producers. Our associate producer is Jayha Joshua Chang. Our editor is Steve Mazur. Scott Velasquez, music supervisor for Freeze on Sing. Dax Jordan is our person on the street. Sam Ada, Rob Spate, and Danny Bringer are our engineers. And Tina Rubio and Marshall Louie are the executive producers for Wondery. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next week. Hey, remember, stay curious, my friends.